everybody. Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Susie Hutchings and I've been charged with the pleasure of introducing Cato Mew as the next speaker. And Cato and I first met 20 years ago at a cultural heritage conference in Alice Springs. And we actually remain two of the few qualified Indigenous anthropologists working in Australia today. And we're also country kin, coming from traditional cultures that span central and western deserts. And Cato is a traditional Nalia man from the western uh, Australian Goldfields region and has been fortunate enough to have experienced a two-way education in traditional Aboriginal law and Western University education and with qualifications in anthropology, archaeology and business management. He is an Indigenous rights activist and leader in the legal pursuit of recognition of native title rights for his community in the Mandajara Nalia native title claim. And please welcome Cato. I would like to acknowledge, and I will not uh, dare to attempt to name the people of this land, but also to acknowledge their ancestors, uh, the current generations and future. In that space we call every when, um, which includes our tūkūrpa, or dreaming. So I'll just start with a little bit about myself. You may have seen that image around. It's, uh, uh, I was surprised to find that uh, in the uh, in the venue. But about a bit about me. Here is where my mother grew up as a as a nomad. So she lived out here with her elders, her old people, uh, the Nalabrini. Dad took on a job as a dogger, patrolling what's largely mum's traditional territories. You know, one of my earliest memories of, with my parents is uh, often camping on the end, edges of the sand dunes. This road is the old Yewara. Oh, Yewara means uh, the road or the highway or the, the way, the track. So where the wheel tracks are today in, in this country and in many countries, it's the, the walking trails of uh, my ancestors before they got into motor cars. And we still travel those routes today. And there we're coming into Milji, that rock. And Milji basically means fingernail. And this rock in the Jogurba, the dream time, represents a fingernail. It's a fingernail left behind by Mamu who was eating, eating people. Mamu are cannibalistic uh, creatures that they often trick people and kill them and uh, eat them. That's a proper greeting for a sacred, sacred rock. This story is important to my people, Nalia people. The Ngalia people uh, were a branch of the Manjujara people and we speak Ngalia. Being able to work with the Ngalia language, I'm able to understand the country better. So one example of that is the place Badaboga. And Badaboga is a rock hole or a wango surrounded by these Wirinyamri trees. Buga is like a bit of a covering, a cover over. And if you think about that, uh, Badabuga is you cover over the uh, waterhole. When you go to that place, you know to expect to not necessarily find it open. And that's how the language relates to giving people insights to country. This is um, part of my country, and as People ask, where do you come from? The little red spot in the middle there is like the middle of Western Australia. Our territories are the, possibly the last part of Australia to be settled by whitefellas. And it was that story of the whitefellas settling our land which resonates throughout most of the non-European worlds. And 
my paper, which we will all find down at the front desk down there, I've left a copy there. Um, I set the scene. I start with Homo Neanderthalensis. You all know that guy? Neanderthal man? Occupying Europe 40,000 years ago. During a period when ice covered most of Europe. At that time, the ancestors of Aboriginal people here in Australia were living full, vibrant, productive lifestyles. And I get people, I ask people, consider what, what is 40,000 years? How many birthday candles is that? And 40,000 years is an immense amount of time for Homo sapiens, Aboriginal Australians, to be occupying a landscape, to be engaged in a cultural pursuit, which we still continue to hold and practice today. So fast forward some 40,000 years, let's dip back about 500 and you come to these group of uh, pirates. Pirates who decide one day that they shall go out to the other parts of the world. Starting with Vasco da Gama. Vasco da Gama, if you read his history, was an appalling person capable of great atrocities, cut the noses off people's faces. And Vasco da Gama brought Europe around to India, uh, to Goa, to places like that. And not wanting to be outdone, Christopher Columbus uh, goes to, I think he was Portuguese too, but he goes to this, the Spanish king and queen and says, Give me some money, I'll go and find some more money for you. I'm not trying to be a, do an accent there, that was my own accent. Um, <laughs> he's going out there and he sails around looking for India and crashes into another place and calls it India and we all know that uh, history again. So these two great Catholic empires are established and they go out into these new worlds and... We heard Adrian talk about restitution because what they did, and this is the act of piracy, is to go out and expropriate the wealth, take the wealth and return it all to Europe, the wealth of the world. All these cultures and civilizations, which were much more developed and advanced and longer term, were prime picking grounds for an aggressive, warlike, pirate enterprise. And jump another 200 years in, or 300 years into the future, we're talking about 200 years ago. We're about to come smack bang face to face with this once again, with uh, the replica of the endeavour about to sail and circumnavigate Australia like it did once before. Or is that accurate history? <laughs> so, Captain Cook comes to Australia. And another theme you see here is it's now the Protestant nations. So I'll bring up religion because religion drives all of this. Religion drives the, uh, the conceptualisation, the minds, uh, the way in which you act, the... Um, you know, how you view nature, for instance, how you view each other. It's in that religion that um, the earth is there, fallow, to be exploited, which is at stark odds to an Aboriginal frame of reference. In our frame of reference, the earth is, we are part of it. We are one of the creatures that share our sustenance from that land, from that spirit. We're, we're related to the trees. We're related to the animals, the elements. So they're completely different frames of reference. 
And it's in that space that the pirates come to Australia. And these pirates, um, I'll keep playing this as well because there's a little video that will play in the background. This is the, I do many things as you may gather, and one of which is campaigning against uranium mining in Western Australia. Oh, do you want to turn that down a bit? Uh, just keep it mellow so you have the music background as I talk. There you can see our campaign, and I'll come back to the pirates in a minute so that we won't leave that. Our campaign where we walked against uranium mining for about eight years. My elders did it in their time over 40 years ago, or 50 years ago now. And we have been successful in keeping uranium in the ground and not allowing it to come out in, in Western Australia. But it's not an easy fight and it's, uh, we share common sentiments with the experience of Adrian and his people. Because this act of piracy is about going, commandeering territories and extracting those resources and bringing them back and investing them into institutions like this. And in each one of these things, so, you know, we are all guilty. We all have devices like this. I lost, my family lost a battle for some territory where there's nickel mine to develop. And that nickel mine um, provides stainless steel. It provides uh, batteries for our phones, for our renewable technologies. So we've got to be conscious and aware of what role do we play in all of these and how does that impact people of the land, people on the country. So a lot of those kids actually grew up on this walk too. <laughs> Some of them were born and they grew up uh, walking our country. Um, the work of those pirates then is to go out there, take the wealth and build the infrastructure, the institutions, the legal system, the laws, the policing, all of those are part of a system that's designed to suppress the traditional owners, suppress the minorities and accumulate wealth for a small proportion of the population. And I think that's something we all really need to keep front and foremost in our minds because we we often fall into this trap of, oh, you know, white fellas did this. But you go back and look at whitefellas, there's a small group of whitefellas who actually did it. And what they do is they sell this message to everyone else and they create this division and they create this um, uh, fear which then drives and motivates uh, various different forces. So, oh that's my poodle. Uh -huh. Uh, as you can see, we have sort of go out there, we, it's a celebration, it's walking on the land, it's engaging in a spiritual act. So one of the things we did in these walks was, we walk about 15, 15 to 20 kilometres a day, depending on how we feel, and you hold this, one of the effective exercises was, what's your thought, what's, walk with a thought for the day. And when you come to the other end, come to the circle, we share that thought. We share each other's learnings, our experiences. One of the great things, and it may have influenced me becoming a vegetarian, but um, one of the great things is that we walk without sugar, walk without meat, except what we may hunt if we do. And in that, you know, we, we noticed that a lot of our community members that participated in these walks, for many it was the first time they actually had a personal relationship with a white fella. Usually the relationships are down the pub or in a conflict zone or something like that. But here they were walking together. 
and sharing an experience and learning together. And it really resulted in um, some of our mob actually finding ways to resolve conflicts within themselves. Because walking, I think I mentioned earlier in a, in a talk, was it is one of the most fundamental aspects of being human, to walk. And it's part of our spiritual engagement with our country and our people. So we'll just jump through a few more slides and then we'll wrap up. But this little picture here is one that I want to share with everyone because while we do recognise there is a fundamental problem with native title, which I'll come back to, but what is going on in Australia is there is restitution happening. There is a process where before very long, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in Australia are going to control up to 90% of the landmass. We either own, manage, control or influence 90% of the landmass. That's happening. It's at early days, there are birthing pains. Uh, I share the, the struggles with everyone else. I've got an Ilua that's been thrust upon me by uh, my... Because my experience is I work for my elders as a young man. All my elders are gone. And now it's my older brothers and sisters who are the elders of our community. And they're not going to enjoy having a young brother tell them what to do. So <laughs> I've been booted to the edge a bit, but uh, that's OK. Or it's on their heads what happens. Um, but we're going through that process. So we're, we're evolving. We're coming through this process. I'm under no Ill illusions. The native title is specifically designed to legitimise dispossession, make it legal. Because one day the white fellows woke up and realised, oh my God, we're taking all this land away illegally. Let's introduce native title and make it a legal process. Section 29's notices, that's, I'm fighting that every day. So I've got exclusive possession over the territory I showed you earlier, 24,000 square kilometres of land, which we are basically the, ultimately the owners of. But miners, mining companies, other people will come and they go to the government. We want to take that bit of land over there and we want to extract the resources from that land. And they go through this process, Section 29, or right to negotiate under the Act, and the process is designed to make it happen to allow it to happen and we resist it. So I have a pretty good strike rate. I think, uh, Helene, what is it? 90% strike rate in stopping Section 29 applications. Um, <laughs> thank you. Because that's something I wanted to share is getting the education, you know, being an anthropologist, archaeologist, etc is learning how that system works and then use that system to benefit our cause, our mob. So I know how that works. Indigenous land use agreements, don't sign it if you can avoid it. <laughs> They're multi-generational, they lock you in, they lock you down and they basically grind you into the dust. That's what Iluas are designed to do. You must be vigilant must be organised, and I love this term from our brothers in the US, must be woke. So I thought I'd just, I've got these few little slides to show you. This is a checklist I've noticed. In my years of campaigning and activating and etc. there's a checklist that the developers use. They go through this checklist. They cry, you've heard it, cry about black tape, red tape, green tape, all kinds of tape. They cry about tape. <laughs> they then challenge the validity of the claims. So to come out and tell Adrian, you're trespassing on your land, you don't have a right to be there. You're not a valid, uh, you don't have a valid right to be there. They challenge those validities. They create a dissenting voice, a breakaway group. Often of your own kin, your own brothers, your own sisters, your own mother, your own father, 
They'll take them, promise them the world and create this uh, dissension. And if they, those fail, then they go and appeal to the national interest. This thing, what is the national interest? We've all heard that. The national interest. They'll come back and call, call for the national interest. I should have the, have the third bullet point there. The most powerful, two powerful weapons that we have as activists. Social licence. And that's why you come together. People power, social licence. And this one, delays can be fatal for development. Delay, 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 delay. Costs, 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 collapse. So, yeah, if you're going out there wanting to start a campaign, there's a couple of little things to keep an eye out for. Um, I wanted to make a special note of our collaborators. Now, this is probably a little bit sensitive and a little bit political, but we've got to name them and point out to our own mob. They are being collaborators. They're out there, they are doing the work of these pirates against their own people, against their own culture, against their own spirit and against the spirit of their land and their ancestors. And what you will hear is they'll come up and they'll attend meetings and they oh, you know, what can we do about it? They're going to do it anyway. You know, we might... <laughs> see Adrian smiling because he's heard it. It's, it's a direct quote. Any meeting in Australia, that's what you're going to get. Oh, what can you do? They're going to do it. We can't stand up against it. I had a saying once, I ran for the Greens many years ago and somebody said, in the seat of Kalgoorlie, and they said, oh, Kato, what chance have you of, you know, making an impact here? And I said, well, you know, I might have a snowflake's chance in hell but at least the snowflake leaves a stain. <laughs> and that's the target, that's the audience. We're leaving a stain, we're speaking to the future, we're creating laws by engaging in uh, case law and that's what we can do. They then engage and create lateral violence, they sign documents. That's all the pirates are looking for, they want a signature. Your signature is worth a billion dollars. If only they understood that. A signature is worth a billion dollars. They take money. And then when they're confronted, when you're standing in a family gathering, oh, no, we didn't know what happened. You know, they, that well, well, he just made us, oh, I don't know what happened, eh? <laughs> That's how they talk. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> oh, brother, I don't know. That's what happens. So... Oops, what's that? So there's the role of the cultural custodian, to be strong. Cultural custodians, we're guided by spirit. First and foremost, we're guided by the spirit of the land because the land has a spirit in it. We're aware of that. We're engaged with it. You breathe it, you live it, you eat it all the time. You hear the spirit of your ancestors. They're there. They will guide you, talk to you. They're, they're also part. They're, they're going through their process. They're merging back into being spirits of the land. And for me and for Adrian and for many others, Aboriginal cultural custodians, activists, Jim, all of us, it's our watch. What are you going to do on your watch? Are you going to let it happen? Or are you going to stand strong and stand firm and pass on to your next generation integrity, pass on the value? So there is no room for compromise. We have to be creative. We have to be inspired. We're talking to those future generations. And by standing up and being counted, we are creating law. Because all those court cases all have our names on it and understand the white fella way of doing things. It's their weakness. The law, they claim to be all powerful, but it's a positivist discipline. Easily influenced if you know how to do it. You just got to be strategic about it. 
and don't let them talk you into taking stupid cases to court. Anyway, that's another point. Um, so I wanted to end with this idea of wealth. We already hold vast amounts of wealth. We're accumulating more in terms of getting our lands back. Like I say, a signature is worth a billion dollars. So why sell it for $50? $100,000, which a lot of our mob do. That's the, the price that they usually offer. Our role is really to defend our country, sustain our culture, maintain our trade networks. So that's something that we as Aboriginal communities really need to get back in engaging with. We need to get back to engage with our trade networks. Understand wealth. Know the difference between stock and flow. So I'm, in, I'm doing a lot of research at the moment on wealth, understanding wealth. And I won't get into stock and flow and stuff at the moment. But the idea is, you know, you turn the tables. So the call to action, and this is for everyone in the room, if you want to get engaged and involved, it's really simple. There are simple things you can do. Create. Create art. Tell stories. With room full of academics and others, we can tell stories. We are artists. Inspire and be inspired. One little check note there, always follow the money trail. Money tells the truth. A lot of us are uncomfortable about money or, you know, feel uh, there are all these baggage intellectually or, you know, on money. But follow the money trail because the money trail will tell you the truth of what's happening. And that's, I think, uh, you know, that's probably a strategy that you guys are doing, Adrian, is looking at who's investing in this project. Go and knock on their doors and say, well, hey, you've got a pension fund in there or you've got a superannuation fund in there and the members don't want you investing in that kind of investment. So always follow the money trail. Connect with spirit. Defend your country. It's the only country you've got. Defend it. Connect with the custodians. So support. Connect with custodians. And for us, defending our country, we've also got to get this term, us Aboriginal people, we've got to get that term back. It's our wealth. Wealth in First Nations. So Adam Smith wrote a book, Wealth of Nations. Wealth of Nations, if, you don't, if you're not familiar with that book, is a book that underwrote the entire development of the capitalist economy, free market, etc., the piracy, uh, the exploitation of our lands, the movement of our peoples as slaves, all those sort of things underwritten by this idea of wealth of nations, European nations. And so we've got to reclaim that. We've got to reclaim our wealth as First Nations, defend our country, defend our wealth, look after our people, our spirit, and for others. I don't know if anyone had the chance to sit in on Wonder's uh, talks. He's offering, Walbury people are offering an opportunity for Australians to connect with country, connect with spirit in very powerful, fundamental ways. So, yeah, well, that's my little Yoma story. And... Ooh, seven minutes over, but I'll leave it at that and...